to the matter that plagues so many and that you will give us uh, the hope of healing which is found in Jesus Christ. I pray that you will be glorified through this night. Thank you for uh, those who will share, who will share openly, who will, um, who will just become very transparent for our benefit. And I pray that you will greatly bless it. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Guys. Well, good evening again. Uh, so thankful that you're here to join us uh, on another Wednesday night for another story of uh, struggle and grace. This is my friend Kyle, Kyle Cashin. Uh, Kyle and I have been friends for a number of years. I'd say uh, more than 10 years, maybe maybe even Sounds closer to 15. Right. Yeah. And so uh, I'm really excited for you to hear him and hear his story of all that God has done uh, in him and through him and is continuing to do through him and uh, even to do in my life through him. And so um, just to kind of set this up, uh, about two years ago, right after the world had shut down, I know I keep using that phrase, but uh, Kyle had called me, and we hadn't really been in contact for a while, and uh, Kyle was married, and he called me, and he, he said, hey, I want to have lunch with you, and I, I need to share some things with you. And he dropped a bombshell on me, and I'm going to let him share that story here in a moment, but just want to put that little teaser out there for you. But um, tonight, we're, we're going to talk about some difficult things. And uh, Kyle's going to kind of walk us through those things, but um, I hope you're coming in kind of expectant of some things. Uh, so Kyle, would you, uh, just before we kind of talk about what that bombshell was and what your story is, would you give us kind of a brief background, uh, uh, where you're from, what family life was like for you, church life growing up for you? Sure, yeah. Um, am I on? Can you guys, okay, sounds like I am. Um, yeah, so as Zach said, I'm Kyle. I'm from this area. Um, and uh, lived in Chattanooga most of my life. Uh, and I guess probably for most people looking in, typical Chattanooga person, go to church, do those kind of things. And, uh, you know, that's just kind of part of the culture that I was in. Um, one, you know, and Zach kind of gave a good intro there and kind of put a little teaser, but uh, I guess some disclaimers that I wanted to kind of put out there too um, is just one that. Uh, this is actually the first time that I'm going to be sharing kind of the story that I've been walking through, me and my wife, uh, publicly. There are plenty of people in my life who, you know, we've been having this discussion for the last two years. But um, with that, just asking for, you know, some grace and patience tonight, because uh, it is something that is very sensitive to both me and my wife. Um, but, and then, uh, really the other thing I would say is, too, that, um, you know, obviously, there's going to be some biblical truth and just things that, you know, we all know to be true that I'm going to share, but um, a lot of what I'm going to be sharing is just kind of my personal journey of, of healing through uh, what ended up happening and just kind of a lot of the things that I did. So I don't want anybody to take away everything that I'm saying as this is the way to do it and only way to do it and the only thing that's helpful, but um, yeah, just kind of wanted to get that out of the way and to kind of set the, the mood for it, I suppose. Okay. Um, so yeah, so you grew up here in Chattanooga. Mm -hmm. um, tell us a little bit more about like, um, you know, I know we, um, you know, a little bit about more about your childhood and how mm -hmm. that shaped a little bit more about who you are and um, give us some context before we kind of dive into your story and even getting more of how we knew each other. Sure. Um, so, uh, yeah, so as far as my childhood goes, uh, I would say, like, growing up, um, and for a large part of my 20s, like, as I was doing ministry and all those things, like, I would typically probably tell most people that I had your average or normal, you know, childhood and things like that, and then as I got a little bit older, like, I just, some things started to come out, and I remember um, just kind of having some flashbacks and some things about some uh, parts of my childhood that were not kind of normal at all, and you know, that'll come into play in a little bit, and then I can go into a little bit more detail about those things, but um, that is definitely part of my story, um, and you know, one thing that probably I know that we want to talk about too is, you know, Zach and I met mainly through ministry, and um, that's kind of the context, again, that a lot of people knew me from um, around the area. I was involved with 
you know, uh, Campus Crusade or crew as they call it these days. I led worship, like I would help out Zach uh, sometimes. I was mentored um, by, you know, some people may even know him, but just a very well-respected person, like I went to a well-respected church. All these things on the outside that everybody would think like, okay, this, this is somebody who, you know, loves the Lord, and that was absolutely true. Um, but, you know, this is like, I guess, an, an upstanding believer, and like this guy's got everything together and, and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I mean, it would be one of those things that, you know, when we kind of get a little bit into my story, most people would just, they never had any clue or idea that that was the actual reality going on. Yeah, you were, you were mentored by Hung Thak, right? Yep. Yeah, mm-hmm. so many of you know Hung as a missionary our church that supported for a number of years, and that's, that's how I got to know you. Mm-hmm. Um, and you led worship for crew, uh, or at the time of Student Venture or Campus Crusade, and uh, we became friends, friends through that ministry. Mm-hmm. And I saw you as someone who loved Jesus, loved students, uh, loved the Lord, and uh, that's the context that we knew each other. Um, so, you know, I, I know you got to do all that. You were partnering, leading worship, going on mission trips, uh, uh, doing all those things. On the outside, everyone saw the ministry and the good stuff, but behind the scenes, there were some things going on mm-hmm. um, that you really kept hid from a lot of people. Talk about that. Yeah, so, um, and this is the, the buckle up moment, I suppose, where, um, yeah, this is kind of the, the meat of it. So, um, essentially, there had been um, a lot of just things in my life that I had hid um, from everybody. Um, nobody had a clue, like people who had done ministry and counseling for years just didn't have a clue, and, um, you know, I was able to just hide it really well from everybody, including myself at large part, but through the process of when we first got married, um, there, you know, just started having some conflicts after about the second or third year, and we started doing counseling, and just things kind of started coming out, and eventually it all kind of led to the point where I came to confess one day that um, some people knew that I had had a struggle with pornography and just kind of, what most people would say is lust, quote unquote, you know, um, that was just kind of the vague way that a lot of people would, you know, use the church jargon, I guess, to say that they struggle with those kind of things. But some people knew at a very surface level that that's kind of had been a struggle of mine. Um, But what I hadn't shared was actually how much deeper that that actually had gone. And uh, my struggle with that was a, was a full-blown sex addiction, and, you know, it had gone all the way into, um, you know, chat rooms, online dating, um, having affairs, like, and so it was basically everything you could think of that is the worst parts of that kind of thing, that ha- had been this kind of almost second reality that I had been living uh, for a very long time, and Again, most people who were involved in my life just had zero clue that had, this had been going on. And, um, yeah, it just, it just kind of came out. Like I said, we were in counseling, and it was just this moment that I think the Lord just kind of stopped me because it was, um, and I'll go into this in a little bit, but essentially he kind of gave me um, what I was wanting. And uh, just to kind of show that this was not going to be it. This, is, this isn't going to fix the issue that I'd had, and this wasn't going to satisfy me, and so he kind of gave me what the desires of my heart were, just to show me that, you know, you still have this thing that really needs to be dealt with, and so, yeah, I mean, it came out in counseling, and that kind of really started this whole process over the last two years of just, uh, yeah, walking through some pretty serious things. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that was the bombshell that you dropped on me, because... Yep. You were meeting with pastors in your church, mm-hmm. and and I remember when you shared with me that you had had this, which I, shocked me. I you know, had no idea that this was this was part of your story and your the, the sin that you were walking through, this addiction, but that you had, bef- even before you were married, that this was this was your story. Mm-hmm. And correct me if I'm wrong, because I may be telling your story wrong. When I, but you you gotten so bad, but then you thought, if I get married, then this will help. Yeah. Yeah, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so that, I mean, that was kind of what I was alluding to a little bit in the sense of, uh, you know, it's almost like a careful what you ask for kind of moment. Um, You know, our church actually right now, we're going through Samuel, and I was thinking about that story today as I was just thinking through this, and, you know, how Israel had this moment where they were 
begging the Lord for a king, and that was his plan, and he had intended to do that, but, you know, they kind of were jumping the gun, and they got Saul, and it was not what the Lord had wanted for that moment, but he still used it, and eventually, you know, they did get the, the, the king that they had been promising David, but uh, it was one of those moments where they got what they were asking for, unfortunately, and that was, for me, uh, marriage. Like, I had really desired to be married most of my life, and it was just, you know, I had come from a very destructive, you know, background with my family. My first memory was the night my dad left, and so that was just the legacy, was divorce and just pain. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's one of those things that I was excited to see the Lord redeem. And, uh, yeah, so he gave me what I wanted. He gave me a beautiful wife, and we loved each other. We still love each other. Um, but, um, and then, it, yeah, it just kind of all, like, everything was falling apart, and it was just like, it was like this aha moment. It's just like, you know, this, this thing that you've been doing on the side that you just hide from everybody, you know, maybe that has something to do with why everything's just falling apart. Mm. And so it was just kind of hit me that, uh, yeah, that was, not only was that it, but it was time to finally let kind of all of that come out. You know, we said last week, you know, sin loves the darkness. It hates the light. And we talked about that last week with mm -hmm. Ryan. And uh, that was so evident in your story. Uh, there was something you told me that when you were meeting with your pastors and walking through the counseling that they were at a loss because you hadn't been honest with them. Mm -hmm. And there was a moment where the only thing they knew about was the pornography. Mm -hmm. and, but they weren't getting anywhere with you. And and correct me if I'm wrong again, but didn't they say something like, either we're done or you're, you're just going to have to be honest with us? They knew there was something. And you said, like, the Spirit had told you. Like, yeah. Yeah, t tell me. Yeah. yeah, so it was that, you know, I was, um, this was actually at a point where things had really were, like, like I said, they were falling apart. I actually wasn't even living at my house. I was living with a friend at the time just mm -hmm. because things were in chaos. And um, so there, like, in this, my friend's bedroom, I was working from home at the time. And you know, I had taken my break to hop on to a counseling session with them, and just for whatever reason that day, like I said, um, well, and the, it's really interesting, and I'll share uh, this verse here in a minute, but, um, you know, we, <laughs> of all books, our church had actually been, we'd been doing a one-year Bible reading plan, and we happened to be in the book of Hosea um, as I was walking through this, and um, actually, I can read it now, because it really does, um, looking back at it, after the fact, I, this had so much to do with it, but, um, and it's just one of those things that you can't plan, like, you always hear these stories, and, and, um, but this was just the Lord coming through in a moment, so the, the chapter that we were going to be going through that day, uh, in our church's one-year bi uh, Bible reading plan was Hosea 6, and so this is how Hosea 6 starts. It says, come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces, but he will heal us. He has injured us, but he will bind up our wounds. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will restore us that we may live in his presence. And so it was just, again, like I said, it was this, mm. the Holy Spirit just kind of, I mean, it just kind of hit me like a wall. It's like, you got to stop. Like, you, this is, you can't keep going with this because this is the thing that is just wrecking your life and your marriage. And uh, it was that moment where it was just like the Lord was saying, okay, I'm, you know, this is going to be painful, and I am going to, in a sense, tear open your, your, your chest and your, and your heart to um, do some work that needs to be done, and it's going to be painful, but it is with the intention to heal you and redeem you, mm -hmm. and so it was just the Holy Spirit, that's the only thing that I can guess, because, you know, it would have been just as easy to keep lying, because there was really, you know, there were definitely suspicions, especially for my wife, and anybody who's been married more than five minutes knows that, like, you just can't hide things from your spouse. They just know. And so, you know, she had her suspicions, but there was really no proof. And so it's something that I could have, you know, just kept running from for my whole life and just not share it with anybody. Um, but it was just the Lord in that moment saying, no, this is it. Like, you, you, you got to come clean. And so, that, yeah, one of the pastors, you know, that I've known actually really well for a lot of my life, and his son is one of my best friends. We've led worship together. And, uh, but he just kind of prompted. He said, you know, I just feel like there's, we've asked you this, and you said no, and, and you know, we just kind of left it, but, you know, coming back to the, is there anything beyond just your pornography addiction that you haven't been honest about, and just, that was when it came out. Mm. Well, you, you said there was the option of just keep lying. There was also the option just to keep 
diving headlong into your sin. Yep. And and just to forsake to forsake the Lord, just to keep diving headlong into that. And so it was the Lord's goodness, like the verse you just said, to, mm-hmm. to tear you apart. And we're going to get into that painful part of it here in just a moment. Uh, I have a question thinking about, here, here you are in ministry, you're leading worship in your church, you're involved in all these things. How did you reconcile that side of yeah. being on stage, yep. leading people in worship, mm-hmm. and having all this, this hidden sin? Yeah, so that, um, one of the things that I've learned in this process is just how little I knew and understood about um, just how deep and uh, almost different in a sense that a sexual sin, sexual addiction is. Um, and one of the things that is, makes it so devastating is that, um, and you actually, you know, there's several times uh, we actually have some pretty incredible examples as we look through scripture and of just people kind of giving us a snapshot of this. But one of the things that I remember um, kind of coming to mind in a, in a l- new light. You know, I'd always read this verse and thought, like, just at face value, uh, it means that we're defiling our body. But it comes from 1 Corinthians when it says that, that we should flee from sexual immorality. Just run. Don't even try to resist. You're not going to win. But just run from it. Um, all other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. And, you know, I kind of took that for face value. Um, and it you know, just thought, well, yeah, I mean, if... if you're committing these sins, like there's that physical component of it, but um, as I began to really start the process of getting into this, what I really learned is that um, there's a second part to that verse that I think is is really important, and um, it's that we've learned, you know, just through modern, you know, therapy and counseling, and um, that there's literally, it changes your brain chemistry. It warps your brain into you know, when we, when we hear to renew our mind with scripture, like it's literally that type of thing where it's, it's turned our mind into this, um, you just don't live and think in reality. And I would learn more and more about that and it's just like things would start making sense and I'm like, that's why I've always done this or that's why I've never done this or that's why, you know, this is the struggle or, you know, it was just crazy the things that the Lord started bringing at me. But all that to say, a large part of how I was able to kind of reconcile being in ministry and, and truly loving the Lord, because I think that's a common misconception, is people who find themselves in these, you know, in these places, a lot of times people just think, well, they're just not serious about their faith, they don't love the Lord enough, they're not, you know, they need to read their Bible more, and, and all of those are great things and, and things to do, but um, yeah, right. yeah. I think it might be going out, so I'm going to switch over to this, if that's all right. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, yeah, so it really, it kind of started to come out in um, understanding that there was this, um, having to reconcile that there was this part of my of my mind that literally was just kind of walled off. In fact, that was one of the things that I felt like, I'm a big word picture guy, um, and so I would try to explain to people um, who would ask, and it was like I had this wall that had been built off in the back of my brain where this reality and the things that happened in the middle, in the middle of, um, you know, relapses in this, uh, it was just behind this wall. And in the moment that it finally came, you know, came out and I confessed, um, that's when the light just kind of shattered through that wall. And, and I told people it was almost like I had built this, this bank account up of just lies and deceit and just all these awful things throughout the years that once that wall came crashing down, it felt like that all got emptied out. And um, it was just very clear to me that that was going to be a huge part of the journey moving forward is not ever letting that wall build back up and not ever retreating back into that that place where you just, you're living in a different reality. And so mm. um, I hope that makes sense. It's, you know, it is a difficult thing. And I think that's something a lot of people struggle with and I can, you know, I struggle with it, you know, there's a lot of times where I'm like, Lord, why, you know, why did you allow me to, to do these things and be in these places and, and bring shame to, you know, your name and, and my name and all these things, and so it's, it is a tough question for sure, but, you know, it's, it's just one of those things that the nature of it, you know, it's just, uh, yeah, like I said, it puts us in a place where we're not really thinking in reality. Yeah, I, I remember hearing, um, 
Tim Keller, he's a, a pastor one time talking about dangers in ministry, and we're all prone to this. We're all, we all serve in ministry in some capacity, but he, I remember him saying that we can be serving in our, our giftedness, and you say, you take a pastor who's gifted at evangelism, and seeing, and they can be seeing people saved, and, but they could have this, these hidden sins, whether it be lust, or pride, or greed, or whatever it is, but they're seeing people saved, so they think, well, God's blessing me, but they're just operating in their giftedness, and same way with Kyle, he was operating in his giftedness, he's leading worship, and so he's seeing these things, so it's, it's easy to be blinded by the fact of, well, God's blessing me, and I, I remember when I heard that, and it hit me very heavily of like why it's so important that we are open and why we're honest with people no matter where we are in life that's why it's community is so important um and so because it's so easy to i mean satan is a deceiver and so easy for us to believe lies so um no i appreciate you sharing that yeah Go, are you gonna say something else well that? yeah so there was actually um i don't know if we can put that picture up so I, there's a picture of a graph um, that I sent over, and if not, I can probably explain it without it being up there. But um, so one of the things, uh, part of my journey and process is, um, you know, obviously I got involved with a group of guys, uh, Zach being one of them, and started doing some very intensive, like, actual real discipleship. But I also started being treated by a professional. He was, uh, he's a Christian um, professional counselor. His specialty was in trauma and sexual addiction. So, I mean, he was very well equipped um, to help me walk through this season. But one of the first things I remember him sharing is, uh, and I believe you said that you've used this even um, to describe sin and just how it can just take us into these places that, um, you know, you look back and say, well, this is how it started, but now I'm, I'm here. How in the world did that happen? And I think it's a perfect example of kind of how this, how this whole process can happen. But if you think about if like, just if you had a graph with a straight line on it and um, whether it can be sexual addiction or sin, you know, any other sin you can really put in that box, but anytime you have a relapse or you act out in it, if we're starting at the, the base of the line, there's this, um, there's kind of like a heightened, uh, w you know, what psychologists would tell us is a dopamine. We, our brains produce dopamine, and that brings this temporary high, um, but it usually doesn't last very long, and when you come down from it, you would think you would kind of go back to baseline or somewhere, but you actually, there's a little dip that comes from that, especially if it's related to like a sin, because there's a big component of shame in that. Um, and so you actually, if you picture the line, you had this, 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 this high from it, and then when you come back down, you're actually starting below the line. You're, you're no longer, and if the line represents just normal, how, you know, being a normal person, normal feelings, living in reality, um, so you're no longer even normal yet. And so for people who, who find themselves in sin struggles and addictions, um, typically it's something where they may have a season that, you know, it's, it's a binge. And so you act out again, you're starting at a lower place, you get kind of the same high from it, but next time when you dip down, it's even further down. And basically what ends up happening is you find yourself reacting to pain in your life, and that's um, one of the interesting things I learned. Um, and it's shocking to hear, you know, when most people actually learn this, that uh, having a sexual addiction uh, it actually has very little to do with sex itself. It's not what it's about. It's um, typically there's been some pretty heavy trauma in somebody's life. That was the case for me. Um, and it's literally the way that your brain has wired itself at a very young age to survive. And so you go into these fight or flight moments or what my counselor would call a snake versus a stick. And I can explain that in a minute. But um, you go into these moments where you're not, you're no longer thinking of reality. You're just reacting. Um, almost said in, in that fight or flight mode. And so that's how you kind of find yourself on these graphs. And pretty soon you get to the point where you're trying, you act out just to even get back to a baseline normal. You're no longer getting excitement out of it. It's not fun or anything like that. You're just trying to get back to a normal level. And, you know, a lot of people sadly find themselves just for seasons of life, years sometimes, where they're, they can't ever even get back there because of this. And so, um, I hope that makes sense. Uh, oh, I think, I think it makes perfect sense. And I think many of us have either experienced some sort of addiction or been around people who have and have seen them act that out, um, looking for the next high or looking for something just to get to some level of normal. So I, I think that definitely makes sense. Um, well, tell us about the healing process. I know we talked about how painful that's been to some degree, but talk about that process. I know you've talked about it a little bit already, but 
um, and what God, how God has revealed himself to you through the process. Sure. So, um, so going back to the day where I had the confession, one of the first things that um, I felt like God really put on my heart almost immediately was to start to reach out to um, some of the people in my life that I, you know, had done life with and that, um, you know, just loved as a close friend, people like Zach. Um, and so that very day, I remember it was one of those things that's like, again, I, I can't let this ever go back to a secret. I need to let all the people that I care about um, who are close to me, in a sense, like so the groomsmen who were my wedding, people like that. I didn't just, you know, blast it out on social media or anything, but um, just those people that are closest. Um, I remember immediately texting that day and said, hey, you know, I need to apologize to all of you because I've been living a, a pretty significant life for a long time. And, um, you know, just remember feeling remorse for knowing that these are people who love me very much. And had I had been honest about where I was at and what I was struggling with, they most likely would have responded in a pretty good way and, and helped me out through it. But I just couldn't get to that point. And so there was just this remorse that came with that. But um, it's, it's, it's weird because there's also, like for me, obviously, and people who um, kind of struggle with addictions, uh, when you do kind of have that moment and that confession comes out, there is um, an incredible weight that's lifted off. That it's, so it's kind of hard to balance because there's this, you know, devastating information that you've given. Um, and especially if you're married, like my spouse, obviously it was, um, you know, my wife's name is Joy, and, and it was just uh, devastating, absolutely devastating to her. And it just, you know, that's one of the things that even to this day, two years down the road, like we're still um, – there's, there's a struggle and, and, and a lot of things, and I can kind of go into that a little bit more but um, in a little bit, but it's, uh, yeah, it was just so difficult. But like I said, on the other hand, there was also this, this moment where it's like, man, I can walk around in freedom for the first time in 20-plus years, you know. Um, and so that kind of began this healing process. I had met with you and, and some of my other friends who another good buddy of mine had actually kind of previously to that, uh, had felt called in his church um, because some people had approached him to start, like, a small group specifically around, like, just working through um, sexual sin and, and, and addiction and stuff like that. And so I had reached out to him and, and said, hey, like, would you be willing to meet? And we can start going through um, this material that um, has been so good. Um, it's put out by Ted Roberts, Pure Desire Ministries. If anybody's ever heard of it, it's fantastic. But um, so we... That was something that happened very early on, and then really, um, you know, just kind of having radical truth um, and, and boundaries, like, for the first time in my life, because, again, going back to, like, how I even lived almost this duplicitous lifestyle, like, this just two realities um, was because of the amount of lies and just self-deception even, um, tricking myself that, you know, everything's fine and, and things are okay, um, and so kind of confronting that in, in a radical way and, and, and kind of, I'm, it's funny because, you know, when I tell people that one of my biggest takeaways out of this season, um, you know, it doesn't sound like it's that big of a deal, but it really is, to me, one of the biggest takeaways was learning to be okay with not being okay. Because I think mm -hmm. that's, um, as much as we don't, you know, we know that it's not like biblical, um, and we wouldn't say that we know that that's a good thing to do, like it, growing up in church, it's very much like, you know, that's just kind of we all almost in a sense play this game where when people ask us how things are, it's like, you know, I'm blessed, great, everything's fine, brother, you know, living the dream, whatever you want to say. And so um, we almost kind of train ourselves to not, you know, be okay with not being okay and just being honest to say, hey, you know what, this is, I've, I'm struggling and this is specifically how I'm struggling. So that was one thing that um, really started to kind of set some things straight and put some some guardrails in my life um, was having that very, um, you know, some some very high level accountability um, and just some radical truth. Um, and uh, yeah, just starting that journey with other men who, you know, it wasn't their exact same struggle was mine, but, you know, it was maybe something similar. And so we started walking through that together. And um, really for the first time in my life, like being completely open and honest with um, some really difficult realities and, and like really confronting the truth of what this is and um, 
I think another one of the biggest things uh, that I had to learn, and again, these, these seem so simple and basic, and it really is, but sometimes it's those foundational things that I found are sometimes the hardest to master, and so really I think one of the biggest things of how it's affected my relationship with the Lord is learning to actually thrive um, with just me and the Lord, because there, was, there were times where it was very difficult in, in dealing with the fallout of what I had done, and um, obviously my wife was, you know, again, it was so hard for her, and um, rightfully so, like, she had every right to be upset, and, you know, she had every right to leave if she wanted to, and she chose not to, which is, you know, incredible. She's my hero. Um, I tell people that all the time, and I'm serious. It was, you know, she took way more on than she really needed to, and she she could have absolutely just mm. had every chance to kind of step out of it at that point, but she chose not to, but in doing that, there we intentionally knew that there was just going to be a lot of pain that we were going to have to deal with because at the nature of addiction and, and even sin is usually people run to it because we're believing some lie um, that God can't or won't supply some need for us. He's not going to take care of us. He's not, you know, he's not going to handle the situation or whatever the case is. And so we kind of deceive ourselves into thinking that, um, you know, God's not going to really be there um, for us as much as we need to be, and it's really ob- obviously more of the case that we just, we aren't honest and open to actually allow him to be that, so I would say that the other biggest thing was just the ability to be able to thrive in a, in a difficult situation and not base how I'm doing as much on what other people think about me, because obviously, you know, that it's a pretty devastating thing to your reputation when you come out with this kind of thing, and, you know, learning not to base it off of that, and even sometimes overall my marriage, as difficult as that is to, to say and sound like, because there were times where it was just obviously my wife was very upset, again, rightfully so, but, you know, if I allowed that to be the measure of how I was doing and my recovery and, and my relationship with the Lord, it, it could have really slowed down the process, and so just going back to the basics of saying that developing that relationship and thriving in, in a way that's just me and the Lord, um, in a foundational way, it was really huge, um, because it allowed me and it freed me up to be able to stand in there in times when my wife really, um, needed to be able to be honest with how she felt, and the, just the devastation, and the, and the trust, the mistrust, and betrayal, and all those things, and, you know, that's not anything, that's not something easy for anybody to hear, but specifically somebody who, um, you know, one of the hallmarks of a addicts is, running away from pain, like, you, you can't deal with pain, and that's why a lot of them act out in the way they do, and so it, it just kind of gave me th- this supernatural ability um, more than I would have been able to normally just to kind of stand in there um, and know that things were going to be okay, that in this moment right now, it's very difficult, and um, but that it was going to be okay. Yeah, so, you know, as far as your healing goes, is first healing with you and God, I mean, just recognizing that reconciliation, but also developing that community, you know, uh, you had, you built in all these boundaries in your life, but also developing these guys, which earlier today, Kyle was like, do I mention that you were in this group with me? Like, is that okay to mention? I was like, of course it is. You just tell them that I'm in charge and, you know. Yeah, I'm, Zach's I, I, the that's, example that's the only role for I'm, all of us in the yeah, group I'm the as model. to what no, to do. Yeah, yeah. No, we all, <laughs> there's, there's six of us guys in this group. We meet every Friday and I tell people it's the best thing I'm a part of, and we all have very different stories, and uh, very different stories, and I mean, we have guys who are there that have walked through abuse, um, guys who just have different struggles, but I, when I heard his story, I was like, I need to be in a place where my sin is not in the darkness, and it, and that's the most important thing for me, and so the last two years have been some of the most healing things for me. I, I, I'm in a ministry where I'm telling people they need to telling ministers they need to be in community they need to live this out i need to be living this out myself and so it's it's one of the most um you know it's one of those healthy things it's one of the most helpful things that i've been a part of and and uh and i mean today one of the guys we have a text group was just like hey guys i need you to pray for me and that's been just it's been really helpful so um you know you, you shared a little bit about your marriage if you want to share more i know that's that has been an on. I mean, just building that trust again, building that love again has been going. But I'd like to shift, and, and I don't. If you wanted to share more there, go ahead. But 
I like to shift to thinking about the church and not just Mile Straight, but just the Big C Church. How much of a problem do you think this is or, or, that you've encountered, especially over these last couple of years? Yeah, and um, so I definitely want to address that for sure because it's um, pretty alarming. Um, but I do want to go back and, and address some things because, uh, like I said, one of the first things I said is this: this story is not just my story. This is this is unfortunately my wife's had to come along for this ride, you know, um, because we are one. We're one flesh, and so um, the nature of what this is really um, sucked her into this, and so. Um, I, I remember asking her last week or the week before, you know, hey, uh, I'm going to have this opportunity to share just kind of like where things are at and, you know, share this opportunity that, you know, I'm not, this isn't the story of like, hey, I used to do this thing 10 years ago and the Lord's completely, you know, freed me from it. This is very much more of a difference like, yes, there are aspects of my addiction that have gone away completely. There's other parts of it that are still there and will, will probably remain for years to come and and that's, that is the battle that we're fighting for, but um, there isn't a complete healing in a sense yet. But um, one of the things I wanted to get her opinion on is just kind of anything she wanted to share, like, um, because again, it's, she has been um, way more than I deserved in all this. Um, and it's just been, it blows me away sometimes when I'm uh, not being an idiot and, you know, uh, in my own thoughts or just worrying about my own self, like, it's just, it really does blow me away how appreciative I am, but some of the things that she wanted to share just from the perspective of someone who may be walking through this season or, or you have walked through this season, um, obviously, there was the trust thing. She said that, you know, it's, uh, not only sh could she not trust me in that moment, but it's, it's really kind of going back and kind of replaying every aspect of our relationship, like, mm -hmm. since we met and started dating and all those things, like, it really put her in a spot to where she almost kind of, like, fell into this pit of just being so um, insecure of everything that had happened, like, and she began questioning, like, was this all a lie? Like, did you just trick me, um, you know, and this and that, and, um, and so that was obviously something really difficult, and also, like, just the shame, um, you know, and for other spouses, again, who've gone through this, that's something that I hear a lot of is that it's just very shameful, like, to, to have your husband or your wife um, ha come out and say that, 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 that they had betrayed their spouse. Um, and uh, so just kind of dealing with the shame of that, like, it made her want to isolate and withdraw and not really reach out and stuff like that. And it was just, it was really difficult. And, uh, yeah, it was just, it, and it's one of those things that, you know, going back to the trust thing, um, again, I had said that one of the things that I had to learn was to um, really allow the relationship with the Lord to kind of be my anchor in the season. Because there were times where, um, you know, my wife would come out and say, you know, accuse me of lying about something or like you're, you're trying to hide something. And, and, and it may be a moment that I'm not like I'm being completely truthful and honest, but I had to kind of take a step back from that and say, because of what I've done, because of the damage I've done to my marriage, and she has every right to be saying this right now. And so it was one of those things where I had to step in and say, like, you know what? You're, you know, you're right not to have to trust me, even though that's not the reality right now, and kind of just have to, in a sense, act like, okay, you know, this is what I get, and I'm going to have to kind of deal with the ramifications as if I was just trying to deceive my wife, even though that may not be the reality. And so... Um, it's it's a very humbling experience. It's a very, um, it's a great way to get rid of pride. I mean, if, if somebody really struggles with that, boy, I'll tell you, walking through that is, um, there's really none left to be had after it, if you're honest with it and just kind of the level of, of it is. So it's a lot of just having to die to yourself um, to better understand and to better serve and to try to step in in those moments and, and really dig into repair. And one thing that she did say, um, which... Uh, I thought was really incredible was she does feel like we have deeper intimacy uh, now than we've ever had in our marriage before. Um, and in a strange way, and this was kind of shocking when she said this, but she in a sense feels more secure in our relationship and marriage because um, she knows me fully now, like fully, fully. There's really nothing to hide. And because we've just been through um, for lack of a better term, just total hell over the last two years, like walking through this and just fighting through this and really struggling together and sticking through it. And so 
yeah, it's brought a level of security in our marriage and maturity that it, it's just hard to get without walking through something just really devastating like that. Mm. Um, so to the question you actually asked, um, how much of a problem do I think this is in the church? Um, so there's a couple statistics that I can give, which I feel are maybe even conservative, to be honest, just knowing some of the people that I've dealt with in my life and knowing um, just kind of what this is. Um, so, again, the the ministry that we've been doing, the material, uh, it's a pastor. His name's Ted Roberts. He has incredible testimony. Um, he has been a pastor at a church in Oregon for over 30 years. He's a clinical psychologist because he just identified this need in an incredible way and just wanted to really go all in on trying to meet this need. Um, but so he's um, kind of put together some pretty exhaustive data on not just um, sexual addiction in America, um, which is pretty alarming, but specifically in the church, um, he says that um, 60 to 70 percent of men don't just struggle with pornography or anything like that, but are sexual addicts. 60 to 70 percent of the men in the church, 40 percent or 30 to 40 percent of women, and he said that that's actually the fastest growing segment of that, um, which is, uh, they said, comes with even more shame because it's typically thought of as that that's something men struggle with, not women, right? And so, you know, I, it's just, I, I can feel compassion for that, um, knowing how much of a shame it was for me to ever want to come forward with this, being this person in ministry, but, you know, I could even imagine more so for a woman who's, you know, quote unquote, not supposed to struggle with these things for them to come forward with that and say, I do struggle with this. So, mm-hmm. He said 30 to 40 percent and um, 50 to 60 percent of pastors as well. Um, Mm. People in ministry, again, not just lightly struggling, full-blown sexual addicts. Mm. And so it's a pretty devastating thing in the church. And there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of reasons to that. And obviously it's it's something that is very difficult. It's awkward to address. Um, It's not an easy thing to talk about. And uh, I think one of the biggest reasons, too, is because, Walking through that and that just kind of the journey it takes to go through this is willingly stepping into some pretty significant pain because that's the only way, you know, one of the things that Ted Roberts always says is when he has somebody who's coming in to be, you know, to be treated and go into their program and to to do these groups, as he said, um, if you think things are going to get better, um, at at first they're not. He said it's you're going to be walking into an absolute world of pain that you've been uh, masking, hiding, running away from your entire life. And the only way to get to the other side of that is to open up, be honest, let the Lord come and, and heal those things um, and bring them out into the light so that you can move past it. And so um, I think that's probably one of the biggest things is, you know, there's the shame component and then there's just the the messiness of it. I mean, it is just an absolute mess to walk through. Um, I mean, you think of the story of, of Hosea in that chapter and mm. just, man, it's, it is not an easy thing to read, and it, but it's the reality, and, and it's actually a pretty good picture of living and loving an addict through that and, and knowing that there's going to be times where they're just going to absolutely betray you and, um, you know, the response to have. Um, and another, I meant to share this earlier, but another story, you know, we all are familiar with, and I think what stuck out to me was the story of the prodigal son is the perfect story of not only an addict, but how to, how to handle an addict. Like we have the prodigal son who himself had to come to the reality and and everybody knows that part of it. But the part that stuck out to me is you have the father and the other son who are these, I think the perfect example of the proper way to handle this type of situation and the improper way. And, you know, there's just a um, tendency for people to just really go very heavy in on the, on the judgmental side of things and to say, like, how could you do this? How dare you? And, and all those things. And, you know, uh, the story of the, of the woman who was brought to Jesus from the Pharisees that was caught in adultery. I mean, it was, that it was the first thing they said. And, you know, the last thing Jesus actually addressed in that was her sin. It was the last thing he said. Before that, he'd walk through everything else and them and, and, and all these things. And his response is, is so difficult because it's just not natural to have that response at all. It's, it's to step back and say, like, okay, wh- you know, do we actually want to see this person restored or do we want to be upset and, and, and all these things? And, you know, seeing those, those stories like the prodigal son and the father who said we're going to have a feast and, it, 
And I can tell you that there was absolutely consequences. It's just natural. It wasn't shared in that story, but, we, you know, there's going to be consequences. And the same thing for the woman caught in adultery. There's going to be consequences of that. But it's just this incredible, um, only the Holy Spirit can really provide, I think, th- the strength to have that kind of reaction and just say, as mad as, as as people can be about that, and rightfully so, like, to, in a sense, almost give somebody the grace who wants to come forward with something like this to allow them to start to heal. And, and of course, there's going to be consequences. And that's the last part that, you know, Jesus says in that story is go and sin no more. Like, so, of course, he addresses it. Um, and so that I would never say that that's not what we should do. But I think that sometimes we maybe just flip that. That becomes a priority. We want to address it immediately and say, like, you know, how, how could you do this? Um, and so, yeah. yeah. That's good. That's good. I, you know, and even those are good, good examples, good, good stories. Uh, and even thinking about this issue theologically, like, you know, the enemy came to steal, kill, and destroy. And he took something that God created to be beautiful and meant between in marriage. And I think we can all think of examples where we've seen it happen very, very close to us or maybe just separated from us where the enemy has come and he's destroyed a family over this issue or he's destroyed the church. You take those two institutions of the home and the church and this issue of sexual sin and how it's destroyed a home or it's destroyed the church. A lot of times in the church, we want to look out there and look at, at, at the perversion of what's happening out, out in the world. And, and there, there is a perversion of sexuality out in the world. But we don't want to look and see what's happening inside of us. And we don't want to look and see what's happening here. Because the enemy is coming to steal, kill, and destroy. And it is, he's taking something that God intended to be beautiful. And he's twisting it any way he can. Um, more so, I think, than just about anything. And, uh, and so we have to be on guard of that. And this is so, such an important thing. And uh, one last question. Uh, we just have a couple minutes left. Um, but I, I think it's an important one. And then I want to give you an opportunity to ask questions as we do every week. But um, what are just some, some practical steps? Uh, someone's here, and they, they think, nah, I'm walking through this, but I haven't really been open. Um, or my spouse is, or, my, you know, I have some friends or whatever. That, to walk towards honesty and healing, uh, what, w- what would you say to someone there? Yeah, so um, that's a great question, and there's a lot, um, and that's kind of like, what I said very initially, like my story may be different from other, what other people's situations is. And so I would never say that like everything I did is, you know, step one through 10 of exactly how you do this. But um, some of the things that I would, would think are very helpful is um, if you yourself um, or somebody you suspect um, is going through that um, to just um, confront them lovingly if you can. And um, for that person to start getting, um, he needs to find, uh, or I say he, he or she, the person needs to be able to find, you know, a couple people that they can be completely and totally honest with. Because that's just, li- you know, if you give leave any space for lies and deceit, it's just going to grow back. And so um, there needs to be those people that you can be just completely transparent with. Um, and honestly, I would recommend, just because it was so helpful for me, counseling. Like, find a good biblical um counselor who can help walk through because there's just so much nuance and so um there's just a there's so much to it um you know there's some other things that I wanted to share tonight but we kind of ran out of time but there's um one of the things about this is how encompassing it is of a lifestyle things that you would never think to connect to an addiction a sexual addiction um are all connected and so like having a professional who is really trained to help you walk through that and to kind of point some things out um is huge, um, but honestly, it's it's going to be having somebody that you can be um, completely honest with, and then if you yourself are um, in that, and you're like me, who a thousand times sat and, you know, would just be wrestling with this and saying, like, is this the time? Is this the time? And no, I never would, because, you know, I just felt like, well, yeah, I just can't, you know, my life would be over, or whatever the case is, and, um, and I absolutely understand that. I mean, I get that, but, um, you know, I would say, just to reach out to somebody. Um, absolutely, I can provide my contact information. Um, I mean, I think most people know how to reach out to Zach or the pastor here. Reach out to somebody. If you don't want to come forward or ask a question in public, I get that. But um, just take one step because I think a lot of times we, 
people just kind of, there's this cascade of anxiety and fear that comes with, like, well, if, I, if I'm honest about this, my life's over, and they just start thinking of everything that could happen. But um, I would just say have the faith to just take the first step and reach out to somebody and yeah. be honest. I, that's, that's really good. Like, and I would encourage it's something you said, too. If you're a spouse and you're, you're, your spouse is walking through something, don't think, well, they need help. I don't need help. We, Kyle and I have seen this a hundred times. Um, it, it is, you both need to walk through this together. Your story is obviously very different. Um, or if you know a spouse that's walking through it, um, encourage them that they, they, they have their own story, that they have their own pain. Um, uh, reach out to, to one of your pastors, Pastor Tom, Pastor Mickey, Pastor Jason. Reach out to one of them. Uh, they are a safe place. Um, I, I'm a resource. I'm not a pastor here, but I would love to be a resource to you. Uh, you can never tell me anything that's shocking, ever. Uh, I, you probably could, but um, for the most part. And so, uh, and, and Kyle, uh, I know would, would you be. You couldn't a tell me anything that would probably shock me. Right, right. To be that's honest, that's yeah. true. That's true. So, um, just some practical things. Uh, if you know anyone that's that's struggling just with the issue of pornography, there's a there's a great app. Uh, I know some people that have used called Freedom Fight. Uh, it's called the Freedom Fight app. It's a free app to help people walk through and get freedom from that. And it's a very biblical-based uh, program to help people walk through that. Uh, if you have the Bible app, uh, there are some, I don't know specifically what are on there. I know some people that have used devotions to help people go through that as well. So there's some things there. If, if you're looking for other, like, uh, books or other things, I can help you there. But the most important thing is to be honest with God and with other people. Find some community. Yeah. And... Sorry, there's one last thing. Mm-hmm. Um, don't die on the hill of shouldn't. Mm. Um, man, there's just, I remember this early on in my counseling, and um, my, he would call me on it every time when I would say shouldn't. I sh- you know, I know I shouldn't do that. Um, you know, because he said you're already introducing shame into it because you're saying that you should have done something and you didn't, and shame on you. But he said shouldn't keep so many people from doing anything, especially in the church, because, you know, I know so many times I'm like, I shouldn't do that. I shouldn't think about that. I shouldn't want to have, you know, this desire. I shouldn't, you know, look at these things or on. But the thing is, when we say that, that's where it ends. We say, I shouldn't do that. But what we're not addressing is the fact that we did. And healing starts with addressing, okay, well, I did do this. Why did I do this? You know, let's begin to actually explore that and let the Lord come into why. So I, that would be the last thing I would say is um, don't die on the hill of shouldn't because it is, um, yeah, it can keep you from making some good progress. That's good. That's good. Well, I did want to ask if anyone has any questions for Kyle or for myself. I uh, would love to take those. And if you, uh, if I need to come back and repeat the question, I can. Yeah. And if you need to ask for a friend, quote, unquote, that's okay. Yeah. Um, we won't judge you. <laughs> Yeah, no. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Absolutely. Um, So, and Zach, I'll let you say something if you want to as well. But what I would say to that is um, you can't save other people as much as we want to. So that's the first thing I would say is, um, you know, we, and I had to learn this in my process, like, there'd be so many times when I'm like, you know, I want to be able to be honest with my wife about this part of this, or, I, you know, I want to be able to do this, but I'm just so afraid that she's going to react this way, and it's just going to, you know, things are just going to blow up, and it's going to go back to all this, and, you know, and the thing is, as simple as it sounds, um, you know, my counselor would always say, you got to stay in your box, like, we can love people and want to help them all we want, but we can't control what they do. And so I'd say that'd be the first thing is is we can't always be the savior for everybody else. And, and I know that's probably not what you're saying, but just in case to kind of comfort you in that. But also just to be available 
and to um, as much as you can, like if if and when people do inevitably come to those places where they maybe find out something, um, you know, they, they walk in on something or who knows what the case is, um, just to, um, in that moment, I understand the, the rage and the anger that can come out of that. I mean, it's just so disappointing and painful, but to take a step back and, and to and to kind of evaluate what what's the goal in this moment? Like, do you do we want to move towards restoration? Do we want to see this person get healthy, or do we want to um, do we want to let just the emotions fly? You know. And so I hope that makes sense. Um, those would be some of the things that I would say. And um, but just to kind of lovingly um, address it if if you do find yourself in that situation. But Zach, if yeah. you have anything else, no, that's good. Yeah, on the res- on the response side, on the what I was thinking on the preemptive side, like. It goes back to the, like, sin hates the, the light. And so I would think of how can you enter into things that are going to keep things in the light. Like, I mean, me and my oldest son, we have Covenant Eyes on our phone. So Covenant Eyes is a fantastic program that, I mean, it's a paid-for program that, um, so all of our screens, uh, I get a report of how he's doing, and then someone else that's in our group gets a report of everything that comes across my screens, my computer, my iPad, and my, and my iPhone. And someone else has access to my screen time. And so, and someone's like, well, you're a grown man. Do you need that? Yes. 100%. Yep. Yeah. And so, um, and so I think I would encourage you all to do that. And I, so for you, for you, Shara, like, um, you know, just thinking about your, your for, so for, for all of you who are fathers and you have sons, open conversations, open conversations with your kids. And, and mothers, daughters, open conversations. Um, and it, it gets harder as they get older, but have open conversations. And if, if, you're, if you're a mother and you have a son and you don't really have a father who can have that conversation with them, find someone that can have that conversation with them, um, you know, and vice versa. It, it, that, those just having openness is so important. And I'd say um, not to manufacture, like you don't need to manufacture my story, like don't make up something, but if you do have anything like that um, in your life that you've dealt with, being able to share that openly with them, I guarantee you, is going to be the best thing to foster that environment that somebody maybe feels safe in, in coming out. You know, if you have anything in your past like that or know somebody, um, I've told many people and friends, like, hey, if you know somebody or your husband or your son or whatever, it, you know, let come, have them come talk to me. I will be brutally honest with them about what can happen when you let this just go unchecked. Um, and I have no problem doing that. But I would say, to kind of piggyback mm-hmm. on Zach, like, be open, like, be, be brave and have courage to share the brokenness in your own life, too, because that, more than anything else, um, you know, really, I think, is going to connect, especially with teenagers, young kids, um, you know, the younger generation, knowing that they don't have this unobtainable standard that they have to, to live up to and that, pastors, people in ministry. It's, it's one of the reasons I was excited to do this tonight. It's just so that I think it's helpful to see people who are quote-unquote in ministry or in leaders in ministry being honest with that and saying, hey, like I'm still in the middle of this right now. This isn't something that I can tell you a story about 10 years ago. The Lord's delivered me. And that's great if that's your story, but I think it's encouraging or hopefully encouraging to, to see that you can still have a place to play in ministry even if you're in the middle of it, you know. Yeah, thanks for that question, Chair. That's a good, good, good question. Anyone else? I know we just have a little moment here. Okay. Anyone got a question for a friend? Well, this has been really good. I'm so grateful for you, Kyle, for your heart, for, um, uh, for being open and honest and your friendship and um i'm really grateful for you uh i really want to encourage before we pray i really encourage you to come we have one more story next week Uh, my friend brian mawazin who is a saudi boy uh will be here with us next week and uh another story but uh again different and i'm excited for you to hear him he grew up here off montlake road and uh, he is a nuclear physicist i only tell people that because i like saying i have a friend who's a nuclear physicist and because uh, I don't have many of them, I have one of them, 
and uh, and so, but he is he's a really great guy who God has done some incredible things in his life, and he's walked through divorce, and uh, and God is still doing just amazing things in his life, and uh, I'm just really really excited for you to meet him and hear him. He lives in Knoxville, uh, teaches at a Christian school up there. He's going to drive down uh, and be with us just for the evening. So I really hope you'll you'll come and be encouraged by his story. So um, yeah. Uh, Kyle, would you pray for us? I would love to. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Father, we just thank you for um, just your goodness. I mean, it's been incredible and evident to me, obviously, in my journey over the last two years that um, you you just can't be outgiven. Um, you have more grace to offer than um, we would ever even need, which is crazy to sound because, man, we need it a lot. I know I do, and, and so I just thank you that you're so good. You are um, so consistent and constant in a world and in lives that are everything but that. Um, I thank you for this opportunity to share um, my story tonight, and that it's, uh, Lord, it's, it's not a, a complete story at this point. It's to be continued. It's, it's um, still very much the healing isn't complete yet, um, and I thank you that um, that's okay uh, because that's just our journey, and um, I thank you that you love us where we're at. You knew all of these things um, while you were yet going to the cross. I mean, you knew that this would be the situation that you would find me in and everybody else, and so that blows me away. Um, I'm so grateful for that. I'm grateful for these people who would sit and listen to um, a story from somebody they don't know, and maybe they disagree with a lot of it, and that's okay. Um, I thank you for their... Um, just patience and kindness to listen. And I hope that if there's anybody in this room, Father, who finds themselves in the place I was in, Lord, that you would um, do whatever you have to to just help them take that first step and, and just see where it goes. Um, I know that it won't be in vain and that it would begin a journey that is going to be difficult, but also absolutely worth it. And so, Lord, we love you. We thank you. Um, and it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. If you'd like to talk to Kyle, he'll be around for a little bit. Thank you.